it's um, Sam, Tim, and Simon here with Aimless Ramblings. It's episode 15, and we're doing capitalism and crises. Crises? Whatever it happens to be. Um, and we're probably going to go off the bat first with Simon. Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, I'm starting off. Uh, so the first thing that came to mind when we talked about capitalism was, you know, you know hammers, sickles, and destruction of capitalism. But after that, I was like, hmm. I remember individualist, individualist, individualist versus um, collectivist cultures and how they like sort of differed in a lot of areas. And I'm like, how does this like translate to cultures and their interaction with crises? So for argument's sake, we're going to say individualist cultures usually like move towards capitalism in that whole kind respect that it's all about the individual and Capitalism is all about keeping up with the Joneses. So uh, I did a little bit of research in this particular area, found two articles that sort of revert to it, so I'm not really going to verbatim read off them. They just sort of discuss the background of what I'm talking about. Uh, But pretty much the takeaway is that individualist cultures, it all depends on the individual's interaction with the crises. So if an individualist goes, oh, I'm going to weigh up the pros and cons of interacting this... So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We're talking about the pandemic that's happening at the current moment. Some people are going, well, I'm willing to risk myself getting infected. Not thinking about, you know, I don't want to, you know, infect everybody else. They're just like, no, I'll take that risk. So they're going out there, they're taking, you know, food, they're doing all this stuff because they're willing to take that risk, ignoring the effect it'll have on everybody else. Uh, in a collectivist culture, weirdly, because there's a lot of collectivist cultures that are from a low socioeconomic, uh, are from a more disadvantaged countries, there's actually a continuing issue because the way that they work together, in some cases, is they actually isolate them way themselves off, which is the ideal. In other ways, they actually physically have to interact to maintain a particular level so that such and such is getting infected and on one hand if the infection is isolated because the individual goes i want to you know for the betterment of the community i want to leave it works fine but in other cases it's people's need to work as a community that's resulting in the spread of uh the the virus between individuals because people find it's their like need to keep the society running and then you have more people trying to isolate themselves, and as such, it's the snowballing effect. So, how do I bring this back to capitalism? Well, capitalism encourages people to think about themselves and try and see what is best for them. And that has had benefits. In you know, Some people go, yes, I definitely need to isolate myself so that I'm better off, and I want to, as an individual, experience a society that is better. However... It also has individuals who weigh up the risk-reward and, whether correctly or incorrectly, decide that they're willing to take that risk, and as such, everybody just has to deal with the fact that they're willing to take that risk. Anyway, does anybody have any questions? Yes, Tim? So, a great way to start the topic, Simon. Thank you for the question. So, one thing I'd like to ask and put to you guys, I suppose, with regards to this whole collectivist versus uh, individualist style culture. Um, and and I'm, as I'm sure Simon probably would say, this is not a pure dichotomy. Everyone, one, lives on a bit of a spectrum with regards to these two, and there is always collectivist examples in capitalist societies, and there's also plenty of individualism that occurs in traditionally non-capitalist societies as well. But uh, do you think that in some ways, if we if we try and understand culture with a bit of a black box mechanism here by saying this is a collectivist Confucian style culture, for instance, say, I know Singapore, uh, and this is a individualist capitalist Western style culture, say Australia, uh, then you might actually miss out on uh, some of the nuance that can occur due to things like misinformation. So like, for instance, you've said, um, in, in this case, you're talking about how people can like weigh up the choices and then they'll make a decision based on that choice. If someone lives in a sort of a, a cultural matrix or paradigm where they, for instance, if you're talking about like Indonesia is a great example like this, you had an Indonesian health minister who was saying at one point that the reason why there was so few reported cases of coronavirus in Indonesia early on during the uh, the pandemic was due to the fact that 
they one had a better uh, immune system, and two, uh, because God was protecting them because they were a faithful Muslim country. So, like, I mean, maybe um, if we if we look at uh, everybody having a common like paradigm or matrix to to view it from, that would make sense. But maybe in an in a in the real world where everybody operates in uh, a degree of misinformation and cultural blindfolding, maybe that's an inappropriate way to try and assess. Back to you, Simon, first. Um, in response to how you were discussing that, you know, there's particular elements that within a collectivist culture who were seeing that there was alternate reasons why particular things didn't happen. Uh, what I was trying to discuss in the collectivist versus individualist culture is we're talking about the John Doe, the every man from those two cultures, or every woman. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be sexist here. I'm saying that every every person, the person, uh, would represent a idealized version of the society. If we managed to work out every element and worked out, you know, our sample sizes, and we picked the ideal human being from those two. Uh, I was discussing that individualists. They sort of it's an individual, ironically by the name, uh, interaction. Whereas a collectivist, it's more about this is the the surrounding the society decides the thing. With that health minister, I'm assuming the people that were surrounded him, uh, as with a lot of religious people, is other people of a similar religion or of a similar mindset. Because you're not going to particularly want to spend your whole entire life with people that disagree with you. Uh, also, a similar thing. Uh, it's a sort of pride that they have that a lot of collectivist cultures have. Some see that for better, some see it for worse. Some want a collectivist culture where they go, well, we've got to hold everybody to the same level, where other ones are saying we're already at, everybody's can be at that level for being part of this culture. That's sort of what I came out from. But yes, so definitely there is a, you know, there's exceptions to every rule. Anyway, uh, Sam, do you have anything you want to say? I do find it incredibly difficult to accept almost that someone could be that stupid, you know, like to be that willfully ignorant. Like, surely, you know, he must have been doing it for individual gain or something like that. There can't have just been such blatant ignorant ignorancy, ignorancism, ignoricism. You know, Tim. I suppose the issue here is that ignorance is coming from our own cultural framework of. Western post enlightenment materialistic physics and science, where there is a very strong causal link that has been accepted between physical, chemical, biological reactions and real world macroscopic outcomes. And that has been reinforced through a very robust post enlightenment education system and a very robust uh, sort of long-standing tradition now in most western anglo and uh you know western european countries where there is a i would say a majority mainstream view of trust in science and trust in scientists uh where obviously there are still aspects of subcultures and subaltern views which is you know anti-vax like you gotta fucking get potatoes and like cut them in half and hold them to the wound to suck poison out that kind of stuff but generally speaking in most western countries people have been acculturated into accepting science and into accepting scientific technocrats in their views whereas when you're talking about countries where political power is not necessarily equated uh well and, and once again Trump is a great example of this. Political power is not equated with intellectual uh, capacity or with uh, subscription to mainstream uh, technocrat and scientific views. But in countries like Indonesia, and it's, believe me, Indonesia is far and away much better than most of sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of uh, sort of the Eastern Islamic world as well when it comes to that kind of subscription to narrative. So like, for instance, in Afghanistan, uh, the, the those kinds of arguments are not only widespread, but are widely believed. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, um, there is a widespread belief in places like the DRC that one of the ways to, to cure AIDS is uh, by raping a virgin. So, you know, that that is another thing to consider. Throwing back to you. Yeah, I get there are idiots everywhere in the world, Tim, but, like, the man is a doctor. He graduated from like one of the best universities in Indonesia. 
He's like literally a medical doctor. So he's not an idiot. He's not, you know, a witch doctor or out practicing voodoo. You know, he's an actual trained physician. So I don't understand then how a trained physician, you know, so he's not, he's not like a retard. There must be something that he personally gains from this. You know, it can't surely just be raw ignorance. It must just be, I'm going to say it's almost malicious, but I don't know. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's two ways you can look at it. In, in this, because I thought you were talking about like you can't believe such a view could exist. But like, if you're talking about this specific individual, I suppose there's two sides of the the coin. One, like he could be genuinely, you know, believing in in terms of the the faith side of the house. Like, there's nothing that stops you from being both a doctor and quite devoutly religious. Uh, and the other side, I suppose, is that by uh, if if he was to honestly admit the issues that existed within the Indonesian system before it's gone tits up like it has now, uh, that, you know, there was some political specific circumstances, maybe not necessarily with regards to him gaining money out of it, but definitely in terms of retaining and keeping power. Simon? I definitely agree that there's probably different elements to this, that there's stuff that could be gained, there is stuff like this, but I believe Sam had another element he was going to talk about, capitalism, because I believe we're definitely going into more about uh, political intrigue, with, uh, politics, and financial, but also maybe the social gain. Um, but anyway, uh, Sam, you had something you want to say? Very good save, Simon, very good save. We do have a ten- tendency to reign a sorry ramble without aim hmm. how about that um i was essentially going to talk about the concentration of um wealth that takes place during or after a crisis so yeah the financial crisis happened recently and it wasn't great for a lot of people but um unsurprisingly the richer you are the better sheltered you were from it you know, uh, where are we? I've got some research from the Harvard Business Review. Scroll downy, scroll downy, scroll downy. Essentially, um, oh, I've scrolled up. So the bottom 97% of the population, so, you know, put that into a factor for a second, the bottom 97% of the population um, has not yet recovered from what they lost in the GFC. That's after 12 years of gangbusters economic growth in the US. The top 3%, however, has um, more than doubled their wealth since then. So this is just a little review thing by the Harvard Business Review. Um, another example that really, you know, I feel brings this home or reinforces it well is the um, organization BlackRock, right? So they're a, a asset management firm. And in 2008, in like, or 2009-ish, 2008, I think, you know, what, uh, being a left-ish leaning person myself, I think is a reasonably abhorrent thing. The US government essentially leaned on this private financial institution and is like, hey, private company, you know, let's help resolve the financial meltdown together. And so in 2000 and, where are we? 2008, BlackRock had 19,000 million, so that's 19 billion, I think, I'm not great at these ones, um, in assets, right? That's in US dollars. In 2009, it had 178,000. That's a tenfold increase in one year. So, you know, this in single organization now has, you know, tenfold as much power because of the US government choosing to lean on them you know so they've become almost like a shadow bank as such of the world you know to have so much resources concentrated within such a small area is crazy and it happens you know it happened after the great depression i think it essentially boils down to if you're middle class you're very likely to have your house as your asset you know and then if you're lucky enough a second house you know that's how you start off because you need somewhere to live and that's worth something. You got to put money into it and then you can buy a house to rent out. It's an easy, safe asset. The thing is, anytime people lose jobs, no one stops buying houses. People can't pay rent. They default, you go under. So the middle class loses all their money 
those that have it in shares have a temporary dip. So yeah, that sucks. But if they don't sell their shares, you know, they don't lose money. They just have a reduction in, you know, the dividends they may be being paid, providing companies don't go under. You know, if you had shares in um, Lehman Brothers, then yeah, you probably got fucked. But hey. So every time there's a crisis, the middle class loses wealth. The upper few percentage of the country have a dip, or the world have a dip, but then they are in the best position to buy. And the same thing happens to companies. So every time there's, I know I'm ranting and I apologize, but every time there's a dip, a certain number of companies can't afford it, right? So, you know, say you've got 10 companies, we have what's going on at the moment with the pandemic, say eight of these companies or seven of these companies don't actually have enough money to continue to exist, right? And three, three of them do. These three, if say two of them have enough money to buy some of these others, you may wind up with afterwards four companies left, three of them now as big as seven of the previous ones. Uh, Tim, you got a question? Yeah, it's uh, actually a really good book uh, talking about crisis and economics. And by this, I'm talking about crises generally, because what you're talking about here really is financial crises, and you've quite rightly identified how it sort of it leads to this uh, spiral of conglomeration. Um, there's a book called The Great Leveler, which is by Princeton University Press, which actually talks about how violence and violent crisis actually results in a greater diversification of uh, sort of resources throughout a population and a an, and, and, and decrease of overall wealth, but also a decrease in levels of inequality. And I was wondering, um, why do you think that during a violent crisis like a war uh, or a civil conflict, as opposed to a financial crisis like the collapse of an economy, because I mean, like, in, in, like you know, a Great Depression is a great example of the worst case scenario of a, a economic collapse, uh, that you have that, that difference between a conglomeration versus diversification. I actually um, don't necessarily think that's going to hold true for much longer. So, you know, you could say like the French Revolution, right? Imagine now if the aristocrats could hire personal guards with, you know, semi-automatic rifles. We possibly wouldn't have had a French Revolution. Um, and I think it's because as soon as the rule structure that says money is sacrosanct, you know, these are the rules by which economics function, so we will follow these rules, um, break down for the bottom half and they choose to get violent, well, those rules aren't going to protect you from, you know, a guillotine. Um, so I think that's why physical violence often results in the redistribution as such, because if you... Um, to go back to Indonesia. Um, the year um, escapes me, but I know there was anti-Chinese purges that took place and they actually resulted in a lot of wealth redistribution because... Post, yeah, post Sukarno purges. Mm, thank you. Um, because, you know, they had a lot of wealth within the community. And so by murdering them and taking their stuff, you redistribute wealth in that manner. Uh, Simon? Um, when you were discussing how there's a whole kind of thing that there's this movement away to violent, um, like, crises resulting in a equality, it sort of reminded me there was a discussion about uh, gun violence where they're like, we need it so if the government ever, you know, goes bad, we can rise up. But it sort of goes a bit downhill when you've got an automatic rifle, yet they've got drone strikes. So it's like this whole entire trying to keep a balance between what the already in power can do versus what the everyman can do. So this is, yeah, I definitely, I'm just throwing out stuff that I come up with that seems to be like relevant. But yes, uh, Sam? Thank you for contributing anyway. Yeah, um, you make a good point, And that's definitely, I think, the reality between a modernized country. Um, you know, if you have a modern country, I think it's dissemination of lethality and such dictates. It's going to be bloody. But if the government chooses to, you know, you look at Syria, um, they're going to win. You know, the Syrian government is ultimately going to be successful, most likely, because even like the most stubborn resistance can't survive against a government that is willing to be brutal. You know, Tim? I would somewhat agree and somewhat disagree. So I think with a Syria example, uh, it's a little unique in the sense that the Syrian regime has been propped up by Iran and Russia. So their ability to continue war fighting 
who's kind of unique in that kind of situation. Whereas if you look at, say, for instance, um, Afghanistan post-Soviet withdrawal, who knows, Afghanistan post-American withdrawal, um, or a lot of African countries when you've had a contest that has resulted in a civil war, a lot of the time it has just devolved because of the diffusion of lethality and because of the inability of any one state actor or sub-state actor to gain control to just constant warfare. And yeah, sure, that's resulted in greater uh, equality in terms of, uh, you know, everybody is simultaneously dirt poor and starving, but I don't know if that's necessarily the best outcome either. Back to you. Uh, I'd um, probably say, yeah, but as I did state, it's in a modern developed country and there's not a lot of, you know, countries in Africa that would be able to go toe-to-toe as such with another government in the Western world, whereas Syria was, for an extended period of time, an incredibly well-developed government. But yes, you're right, they have had external support, as had the people opposing them. You know, the nature of proxy wars, we apparently love them, Um, Simon. Uh, Another thing I'd like to bring up about that sort of like battle between, uh, you know, violent elements. Um, I feel like for a while, what was sort of seen as this equalizer was the media and getting the sort of uh, like visual element. And as that's been undermined by, you know, monopolies, as in the case of Australia or the uh, decrediting, as in the case of America, it sort of made this single, I'm not going to say single, it's like especially the uh, what is it the fifth pillar of the society or something. I remember reading that somewhere. Where it's supposed to be this thing that keeps the bastard honest, as they like to call it. But yes, um, it's very interesting to see that like sort of the there's this degradation of media across the world as time's going on. And do you feel like that's actually going to result in like a worse outcome for people, as you were discussing, of the middle class and low class? Yeah, I definitely would second that as well, Sam, because I don't think it's just the media. In terms of, you know, billionaires, uh, Murdoch can buy uh, large media enterprises, which they then uh, use to push their own political agenda. But, I mean, even in the um, in the academic space, uh, academia, you've seen uh, certain fringe uh, philosophical and economic theories which have gained a lot more traction and prominence than they would otherwise have because they have been funded by people who uh, have a vested interest in retaining their money. For instance, uh, anarcho, well not anarcho, more so libertarian uh, groups who uh, are really big on the whole small government low tax. Uh, Moving through the uh, Reagan era and the Thatcher era in Britain and America, uh, you had an entire crop of academics and thinkers and novelists and journalists uh, who were really in- inculcated into that particular uh, sect, for want of a better term, uh, and which was upheld and uh, sort of sustained by the suckling at the teat of a a class that had a lot of money and wanted to keep it and wanted a, a justification for why. Uh, Sam, do you have something to say to that? Or well, Simon, you got something quick? I think it just kind of ties into the generic dissemination of lethality, as we mentioned before. You know, now everyone has the ability to espouse their views to the world. Um, and, you know, as you were mentioning before with the media power, it ties in with. Um, you know, the whole topic is a the topic is a whole of capitalism responding to a crisis because you've got Murdoch who is opposed to climate change, or like I mentioned before, BlackRock, who has been massively responsible for financing um, climate opposition stuff. You know, this is a large crisis that we're unable to respond to because of our capitalistic structures. So, uh, what I was going to discuss is hoarding, uh, and how hoarding is actually uh, a demonstration in a negative sense of what we have seen as traditionally inculcated in a uh, a neoliberal uh, sort of post-1980s economic system of... It's just an example of behaviour which has been encouraged in a normal time, but when it's put in the context of uh, the pandemic in this particular situation where it's seen in a really negative light. So we... And I, I'm not going to lie, I, I stole this heavily from an ABC article, which was, uh, you know, quite similar on the topic. Topic, but basically, uh, if you look at uh, a a unmitigated neoliberal capitalism, 
uh, the whole idea is that we encourage and we recognize and we reward individuals who strive, you know, develop their own corporations or, you know, find that corporate niche and then, you know, exploit it ruthlessly in a sense that results in squeezing out the opposition, monopolizing the market share and, you know, and making out big bucks for themselves. Now, on the other side of the, the sort of the coin, we've had a pandemic, which has resulted in uh, flash buying. So initially, obviously, um, a lot a lot of the people that were, were making a run on uh, things like toilet paper and hand sanitizer, like, you know, there everybody uh, who went and bought that initially, I'm not saying they were trying to make out big with uh, bank. But for a lot of people, there was fear that they would run out, and so they were trying to protect themselves first and their families. So that's one aspect of, you know, you could argue the selfishness side of the thing with regards to collectivism versus individualism, blah, blah. But the the thing that's more troubling than that is really uh, when you start talking about people who have hoarded uh, toilet paper and hand sanitizer in a time of need for the purpose of selling it uh, online or even, you know, I remember driving through Sydney and I saw a guy with a hand uh, handmade sign saying, you know, uh, you know, on the side of the road selling toilet papers out, uh, rolls out of the back of a, a the back trunk of a car. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that, it, honestly, individuals have found a market niche, which is toilet paper and hand sanitizer, and they've recognized a massive surge in value of those products as, you know, demand has gone up and supply has gone down. And so they're exploiting it. And, and if it was not in the context of a pandemic and what people see, see as right, that's quotation marks there, you know, uh, these people wouldn't be being punished. You wouldn't have, you know, our Lord Fuhrer, Peter Dutton, potato head, uh, saying, you know, how dare these people, I, I'll crack down on them with my Waffen SS border forces to, to stop them from, uh, you know, hoarding these things and not giving them to old people. Uh, Simon, you got something to say? Because I was, before I do throw to you though, uh, just a question for both of you to mull over is like, at what point, because um, there is arguments to be made for how private, uh, private capital, private ownership with government intervention can be more efficient in some ways and also trigger greater economic growth. But what I would uh, throw to you is that at what point um, does a government choose to intervene in a hoarding situation, uh, specifically a hoarding situation, uh, to prevent, you know, what would be called, I suppose, uh, well, you know, vulture capitalism, basically. Simon? Okay, so I'm going to start off with... Um... There's toilet paper and sanitizer as a required need on one side. And the closest, I think, in recent history that we can pull up where hoarding has also been used, but in a completely ridiculous way, is the Szechuan sauce fiasco after the Rick and Morty episode where they, you know, wanted to bring back Szechuan sauce. Um, and it's just watching how similar things happened, except one, zero people gave a crap about because it was Szechuan sauce and, you know, People were, like, swapping cars for these, like, tubs of sauce. It was, it was completely ridiculous. And then you had, on the other side, thing. And when it comes to, you were talking about how the government has to control it, that, I know, I know I'll get into a bunch of trouble for this, but the thing that came to mind is the reserve list when it comes to Magic the Gathering, which was when, I think it was beta came out, a bunch of people were getting really scared because people were, re they were reprinting particular cards and these people felt like it was devaluing their cards. So they made a little, like, it wasn't even a written contract. It was like a little, like, social contract between them and the, you know, the people buying these cards, that there was a particular list of cards that they would never reprint. And since then, these cards are now worth, like, a couple of grand each. And it's further brought forward into Commander where there's a lot of Commander staples which are now going up in price because you need them for every single one of your decks and the way that they're trying to deal with that is just disperse more, but you can't really do that when it comes to um, toilet paper and uh, sanitizer. It's also a very common use in World of Warcraft, Dirt Stuff Market. Anyway, Tim? I was just going to say I can throw back to my early child years and the uh, chitter and chatter that came around the school when somebody had a Charizard, uh, which was the ultimate Pokemon card with that first sort of printout. Um, 
Sam, I suppose, do you have anything you want to say about uh, hoarding? Um, well, yeah, like you pointed out, it's actually idealistic capitalism behavior, you know? It's perfectly natural. Um, as such, I unsurprisingly don't actually think capitalism works terribly well. Um, and I think for a free market to function truly, you need heavy government intervention. So I would view, say, uh, antitrust, to use the American terminology, laws, comparable to hoarding laws. You know, if I don't let Google, say, have the kind of monopoly that it does have and, you know, would instruct the firm to break itself up, um, that's much the same as preventing hoarding, except it's on a corporate scale instead of a private scale. And so we do have, for the most part, um, in our society, laws against um, monopolies or cartelism and the like, which is comparable to small-scale hoarding, you know. We don't tend to like to encourage the negative aspects of capitalism. What do you reckon, Tim? Yeah, I suppose, uh, you know, that, that is something that has been... I mean, as early as Adam Smith and his... Uh, Arguments with regarding anti-capitalism and uh, sorry anti-cartel uh, style uh, policy. But one thing I was going to say as well, I suppose, is that in the modern globalized uh, world, we've seen also with carteling, uh, monopolies, and abuses of corporate power and I suppose the capitalist excess uh, that it's really a transnational issue. So. For instance, when it comes to individual companies like Google, like Apple, avoiding taxes or paying taxes in the areas where they're actually earning money by shifting a lot of their money offshore in places like the Bahamas or Panama. But also another issue, I suppose, is that if anti, uh, anti-cartelling, anti-monopoly laws reduces the international competitiveness of companies, uh, we then also have the issue of, for instance, say a, a state-run monopoly uh, or a state-supported monopoly, like in China, where uh, you have something like Huawei, which now dominates large aspects of 5G technology. Uh, you know, though that will not be able to be competed against by countries that use anti-cartelling uh, uh, sort of legislation. So, I suppose, what do you think the how is it essentially we have to resolve these things at a transnational level, where we need to come to an agreement between nations to stop co- companies from exploiting the uh, the seams in between them and two uh i suppose like how do we deal with uh, those parasites or cheaters or those that work around the system to establish niche and control over key industries i'll throw it to you first sam and then simon so the um world trade organization actually got a reasonably um good setup for this so they class countries into like you know um not developing developing and developed essentially and what you can get away with in terms of international trade differs for both of those. For instance, we put up with China at the moment doing what it does because it's a developing nation still. We go, okay, well, we'll let them cheat a little because it's better for the citizens of them all. We as the rich world can kind of deal with it. You know, our industries are robust enough to compete with them propping up um you know, essentially you'd be competing against the Chinese government. Um, but say they tick over from a, there was recently a push to try and get it to happen from a developing nation to a developed nation. You go, okay, well, that's a, um, you know, that's all well and good. You can do that in your own country, but we're going to um, refuse to allow any trade from you or, you know, or we will not buy any products from this company. And that doesn't violate any uh, World Trade Organization policies. You know, if you it, it doesn't work amazingly, but people take each other to the World Trade Organization courts for like settlements or agreements all the time. Like I think a few years back, uh, the US took the EU about subsidies to their car manufacturing. And I think they um, were reasonably successful from it because everyone always puts, I think this is actually incredibly circular. Um, so this ties perfectly back into an individualistic or a collectivist international concept so well done Tim so um, you know if you have countries that act individualistically like you know China going China is all that matters or Germany going the German people are all that matter um, you will have you won't be able to really have a functioning system however once you can get countries to agree you know it's 
the greater good or collectivism to a degree, then you can have this broader framework that actually doesn't help everyone the most, but helps everyone a bit. Uh, that that was a rather interesting discussion, and of course, it was completely deliberate, Sam, that we ended up going in full circle. It was uh, my plan all along. All right, uh, thank you everybody for listening in, and hopefully, we'll uh, hear from you next time. This great warrior has left all his martyrdom.